Uh, my name is uh, Cliff Buddle. I'm a senior editor at the South China Morning Post. Uh, so uh, <coughs> I work in a profession uh, where we uh, <coughs> uh, do uh, intrude on people's uh, privacy from time to time, uh, but I like to think for, for good reason and in the right way. <coughs> uh, <coughs> privacy and media regulation in the internet age uh, difficult to think of a, a hotter topic uh, at the moment. Uh, privacy, of course, uh, affects us all. and The development of technology uh, makes it easier uh, for our privacy to be invaded. We've been reminded of that recently with the uh, revelations of uh, Edward Snowden. <coughs> Uh, I don't know if the, uh, the NSA or GCHQ are listening in today. <clears throat> if they are, welcome. Uh, please pay attention, uh, you may learn something. <laughs> uh, but of course, it's not just uh, uh, intrusion by, by governments uh, about which concerns have been raised. Uh, very much uh, involves the media uh, as well. Uh, the, uh, the much debated uh, phone hacking scandal uh, in the UK uh, and its aftermath uh, have sent uh, reverberations around the world. We have seen uh, uh, proposals for reform uh, and in some cases uh, reform uh, uh, in other parts of the world, uh, calls for tighter regulation uh, of the media. Uh, and we've seen lawyers, politicians, <coughs> media organizations uh, and uh, those that uh, uh, desire uh, stronger regulation, uh, celebrities and others wrestling uh, with these issues. Uh, so there is much to discuss and uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have uh, a highly distinguished uh, panel uh, today. Um, I will introduce them uh, very briefly. Uh, we have uh, Lord Hunt, uh, an MP for many years, a former uh, cabinet minister, uh, a commercial lawyer, and chairman uh, of the Press Complaints Commission uh, in the UK, uh, uh, taking up that position in the, uh, the wake of the phone hacking scandal. Uh, I understand he applied for it, so uh, he certainly doesn't lack courage. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, hearing uh, what he has to say uh, about those uh, rather uh, dramatic uh, ongoing developments. Uh, from Australia, <coughs> uh, we have Peter Bartlett, one of Australia's uh, top media lawyers, represented media companies in uh, defamation, privacy actions, taken part in uh, uh, <coughs> uh, advising uh, on reforms in these areas. Uh, so we look forward to uh, hearing about the uh, post Leveson developments uh, in Australia uh, from him. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Ursula Cheer from the University of Canterbury uh, in New Zealand, uh, an expert uh, in media law uh, and related issues. Um, she will be talking to us uh, about developments there. From Hong Kong, uh, Professor Joseph Chan, uh, a professor of journalism and communication at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, and also chairman of Hong Kong's own uh, press council. Uh, <coughs> uh, and also uh, joining us from Indonesia, very pleased to have uh, <coughs> Christiana Chelsea uh, Chan, uh, <coughs> Uh, a member of the Press Council of Indonesia, uh, who will be talking to us about some very interesting uh, uh, developments in that part of the world. So, let's press on. I'd like to invite uh, Lord Hunt uh, to start the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cliff. I'm delighted to be back in Hong Kong. I think the last time I was here, as some of you may know, I was global chairman of the English-speaking union for six years. 
and uh, always used to come to Hong Kong to hear English spoken and debated uh, at the very best, the very top. When I was involved in university debating, um, and I by accident won the British debating championship, and then of course the world debating championship, the very best lawyers were far better than me, and debaters, they tended to come from Hong Kong. And uh, I suppose my only other experience of Hong Kong was when I came as a junior trade minister in 1981. Can you? No, before any of you were born. <laughs> and I decided that the British Airways monopoly should be removed. And with John Knott, we uh, laid down an edict that what was then called British Caledonian and Cathay Pacific should also carry on that route from London. So I've always been in Hong Kong at times of some controversy. And you couldn't get a wider and deeper controversy than over the future of the free press. And in many ways, Cliff, delighted to be under your moderation, because I feel very strongly about all this. I see I'm supposed to talk about privacy. Well, I'm not sure in my life I've ever been allowed any privacy at all. Uh, <laughs> nor have I wanted it as a public figure, except for my family. I, I, have, ne I have been slandered, slandered and libeled uh, more than probably anybody else on the planet. And I've never, ever sued. The only time I ever took advice on suing was when a major newspaper thought mistakenly that I was the man in a sex scandal, when actually it was one of my fellow cabinet ministers <laughs> at the time. And the newspaper went into some detail in describing the sort of acts I'd been getting up to. And I took advice. And I was told that because I was seen as such a sort of subdued private individual, I could only be hired in the minds of right-thinking people <laughs> if they read what I allegedly been doing. Now, the press in the UK has for many years been subject to self-regulation. And I uh, circulated, which you'll get, a sort of analysis of the history of all this from the Press Council in 1953 to the setting up of the Press Complaints Commission in 1991. And I should declare an interest. I was in the Cabinet uh, under Margaret Thatcher, which asked for a report from Sir David Calcutt into the whole question of uh, press intrusion. And I was in the Cabinet that received his report, and also then in John Major's Cabinet when we received his later report. So I'm well aware that although I have very strong views about the freedom of the press. Dating back to when I was chairing the British Youth Council and I stood on Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park and sounded off on, on every topic, most of which I knew nothing at all about, but I had an opinion. And thanks to free speech, um, no one ever objected. And when I was a solicitor, I acted for probably the most serious case of thalidomide, the late Julie Lane. Uh, we won huge damages, but wholly thanks to the intervention of the press and Jack Ashley, a UK member of parliament, who forced uh, what was then distillers into conceding that they were responsible. The free press has huge advantages. But coming on to what Cliff mentioned, the phone hacking allegations, that probably is, I suppose, the biggest setback that the press has suffered for many years. We, I suppose, did go through phone hacking a great deal with the squidgy gate. gate. And I remember one of my ministerial colleagues, Richard Needham, was recorded uh, by uh, sources in Northern Ireland when he was a junior minister under Margaret Thatcher, phoning his wife and saying, don't worry, we'll get rid of the old bag soon. And he was then publicized thanks to this hacking of his phone. Margaret Thatcher, give her her due, didn't sack him. 
but the next meeting was a little frosty uh, with her. <laughs> but, uh, so phone hacking had been around a little while. But I think what happened was that the extent of it had gone completely out of hand. It was illegal, it was outrageous, and it reached a crescendo when the phone of a victim sadly murdered uh, in a terrible case, um, Millie Dowler, uh, was um, believed to have caused serious disruption to that family and made them believe when sadly she was no longer alive that she was still, um, uh, of, she was still in this life. And I think as a result of that, the forces were very much in favor of producing some degree of regulation of the press, which perhaps went beyond just self-regulation. And uh, politicians lost confidence in the system. I was not involved in any way, but I saw what was happening with some degree of trepidation. Uh, I'm a solicitor. I, I may have been in Parliament for 38 years, but I've been in my law firm for 47 years. And I've always felt very strongly about freedom and freedom of the press. I'm vice chairman of an organization called Justice. So you will see that I do have a lot of background in fighting for people's ability to say what they think and not be punished, provided they keep within the rule of law. So, so as Cliff um, implied, I had to have a little courage when I applied for the job of the Press Complaints Commission Chairman. And I did so right at the heart of this because the previous chair had resigned. And I applied. But first I went to, two, to see two senior editors. One, Alan Rusbridge at The Guardian, and the other, John Witherow, of the then the editor of the Sunday Times. And I got an idea from them of how serious the situation was. And I then, that afternoon, two years ago, I went before the committee that was to decide on who should chair the Press Complaints Commission. And I put forward a proposal that, uh, please will you select me as chairman of the Press Complaints Commission her commission so that I can wind it up and create a new body. And I was very serious, and so were they. They appointed me. There was a lot of competition at the time from all sorts of generals like General Dannett, and all you know, amazing, somebody who ran Channel 5. Um, but I got it on the basis that I was going to start afresh, and that is what I have sought to do. I called a meeting of all the editors and publishers on the 15th of December, 2011. At the time the Leveson Inquiry was underway, and I gave them a model, a completely new body, still with a complaints arm, but this time with a standards and compliance arm, administering the code in a truly independent way. And to my amazement, they all agreed. Well, I did what a lot of people do at the end of the meeting. I said, is there anyone here who is against what I'm suggesting? <laughs> and nobody put up their hand. So I said, all right, it's unanimous. I then went to Lord Justice Leveson's inquiry. And I must say, Sir Brian Leveson is an incredible character who I, we both grew up in the heart of Liverpool, went to school in Penny Lane. And I think he was given a brief far wider than it should have been. I don't know why he was asked to co cover culture, ethics, as well as press regulation, but he was. And I think he did an excellent job, although Lord Lester and I may differ a little bit on emphasis. Uh, I warmly applaud what Sir Brian did. I went to his uh, inquiry on the 30th of January last year. I presented the model and he then said, that looks good. How are you going to persuade all the editors and publishers to sign up to it? And I said, quite simply, I don't want any laws. Because as soon as you go anywhere near Parliament, it gets too complicated. I said, 
I'm going to do it by a system of commercial contracts. They'll all have to sign up for five years to this new body, agree to fund it, and let it be run by a completely independent board with an independent majority. People from the industry, but an independent majority. And he uh, said, yep, go ahead. The press did come back with their response, but when Lord Justice Leveson published his proposals on the 29th of November last year, he said that the model was okay, but it needed serious changes and adaption. But, and this is the problem, he did not think the press would sign up, and he did think that there was a need for a statutory backup in case the press changed their ways. Now, that is where the problems have arisen. I now have got the press virtually without exception to agree to sign up to setting up a new body. It's called the Independent Press Standards Organization and I understand the contract is in its final stages. Everyone is now ready to sign. I could go through all the detail but it's in the document you're going to have. But it is a majority of independent members at every level. The power to impose a million pounds worth of fines for serious or systemic wrongdoing, upfront corrections and adjudications uh, whether editors like it or not, a standards and compliance arm with investigative powers, an arbitration service, a whistleblower's hotline, and a warning service to alert the press and indeed other media if members of the public make it clear that they do not want media intrusion. Now, I think this body will be the most stringent body in the free world, so far as the press is concerned. But so far as the politicians are concerned, this is nowhere near good enough. What has gone wrong is that they have gone down Lord Justice Leveson's route of what happens if they don't sign up and how can we make sure they keep to the standards of this body and don't, after just a few years, pull out and go away. What Lord Justice Leveson decided, and it is a massive report, this is just one of four volumes, 1,987 um, pages. Uh, what he said in just a paragraph which really didn't feature as one of the main recommendations, was that there should be, if you don't join up to this body, the ability for um, the court to award aggravated or exemplary damages. It's on page 1,771, <laughs> if you want to look it up. That has now given rise to everyone saying in Parliament, well, we've got to have some sort of control. Um, and therefore, if you don't join up, you're going to get dosed with exemplary damages, and I agree what Anthony said about that. What a nightmare. What a nightmare. But some young member of the government, he's, government for, he's minister for government policy. Can you imagine having somebody in a government of 110 ministers who is minister for government policy? He's called Oliver Letwin. He came forth and he said, the answer is simple. And for those of us who've operated bodies under a royal charter, it didn't quite appear as simple as he thought it was. He said, let's have a royal charter. We'll have a royal charter. And this is where we have now got stuck. For, I suppose a year now, because on the 29th of November last year, I said that the model I proposed, I accepted each and every one of Lord Justice's recommendations. His principles were superb, and we would now set up the body, and I asked the immediate past president of the Supreme Court, Lord Phillips of Worth Travers, Nicholas Phillips, if he would set up the, the independent board that would choose the independent board. What more could you ask for? But no, Mr. Letwin said, well, we better have a royal charter. So for nearly a year, we've been down what I call a cul-de-sac. And the 
The object that emerged last week in our parliament uh, would make even the most repressive uh, regime in the world think that parliament had gone too far. I'm just going to put up on the screen the first page of the charter. And this charter, look at all the whereases. I could go on for ages, except I've lost my, isn't there a, ah, I could go on, look at it. Can you imagine this, this is going to govern the press. Um, <laughs> I mean, you just, you couldn't make it up. <laughs> and I just tell you, and this is perhaps my just final remarks, given my short space of time, I will fight this as long as I have breath in my body. Because the last thing we want is Parliament with, a tr with, with the sort of lock that they are giving themselves in this charter. This charter means that the criteria governing this new body can only ever be changed by Parliament. It cannot be changed by the press, it cannot be changed by the public, it can only ever be changed by Parliament. I just tell you, we are going down the wrong road. Let's get back to the main road and set up the new body without reference to some nonsensical criteria which really would destroy our free press. Thank you. So madness, the wrong road. How, how is this playing out in Australia? Well, Peter. A, cup, a couple of things first. I, um, I'm not sure who organised the uh, order of speakers, but I became very nervous and was shaking a little when uh, Lord Hunt introduced himself as the world's best debater. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I might say uh, in the morning session there was also discussion about libel tourism and uh, we heard uh, Heather talking about uh, the loss of London and Lord Justice Lester talking about um, Belfast potentially benefiting and <coughs> Hong Kong maybe benefiting and uh, Toronto, Paul put out an advertisement for Toronto. Um, I should tell you all that uh, Sydney in Australia has far more uh, defamation cases issued every year than London has ever had. And so Sydney is actually uh, the libel capital of the world. Um, we also heard from Lord Justice Lester about um, his frustration that uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland, wasn't going to introduce or didn't look like introducing the new Defamation Act. Um, his frustration, um, I think, uh, he doesn't really recognise how lucky he is. Um, he has, uh, with a great effort, passed the, uh, the UK Defamation Act. Um, in Australia, from the mid-70s, we were trying to get a Uniform Defamation Act. Uh, and as Andrew mentioned to you, um, we don't have to go through one parliament, being the Parliament of Westminster. Uh, we have to go through eight separate parliaments. Eight separate attorneys general have to agree. They then have to get it through eight different parliaments. We were very lucky uh, in 1985 that we had Labor governments, uh, Labor Party governments in every state and territory. Um, and then we had a liberal, a conservative government federally. And that federal attorney general said, um, unless you agree and <coughs> to uniformity, I will bring in federal legislation. Um, and so the states and territories were gra dragged uh, screaming to uh, introduce that legislation. And it was a great thing when we got that legislation, but uh, now I see the UK act and think we've got a lot further to go and uh, hopefully, Andrew says it'll never happen, but hopefully we can get those eight parliaments to agree on some of the amendments that Lord Justice Lester has got through uh, the English Parliament. Um, then turning to the subject of this talk, um, media regulation. Um, Australia is in a totally different situation to, uh, to the UK. 
Um, I was actually in London uh, at the time of the Millie Dalla um, uh, issue was uh, aired uh, and was also there for the last issue of News of the World. And I have never seen such tension coming out of newspapers. Um, front page of every one of the quality uh, papers in London. Um, and it, it was extraordinary. Um, and then you see Lord Justice Leveson appointed. And that guy was given an impo impossible job. Um, he had, on the one hand, uh, the politicians with all their different views and agendas. Um, he then had the media, um, who obviously were reluctant to see drastic change. He then had the victims. Uh, and then when I was there, the lawyers of the victims were also very vocal uh, and active. Um, it was a very, very difficult task. And I think it's fairly easy to uh, uh, throw darts at Lord Justice Leveson, but uh, I would not have wanted to have been in the position of actually having to produce that report. Um, and I should say that I'm a little biased because um, I uh, actually wrote to Lord Justice Leveson and invited him to Australia, and to my amazement, he came. Um, so I have met him a lot of times and was in his chambers two weeks ago, when he, the week he was appointed president of Queen's Bench Division. Um, and as Lord Hunt said, he is a delightful person uh, and was put in a very difficult position. Um, in Australia, uh, as a result of the Leveson issues, even though we don't have any hacking type history, or any of those uh, issues that were raised in the UK, the government did appoint uh, two inquir inquiries, one being the Finkelstein inquiry and one a convergence review. Finkelstein looked at print and the convergence review at all of the others. Finkelstein brought down his report in February 2012 and ordered, um, recommended a uh, new body to replace the Australian Press Council, which is self-regulation. Uh, with a new media council, um, which would be government appointed. Very controversial. Uh, the Convergence Review came out in April of the same last year uh, and uh, supported the um, self-regulation of the media uh, and opposed strongly uh, any government intervention. Our Minister for Communication then ignored the Leveson Report, ignored the Finkelstein Report, ignored the Convergence Review, and he came out with a bill uh, that appointed a public interest media advocate, appointed by the government, who basically would have the power to order the media to join a particular um, regulatory body. And to the degree that they didn't or didn't follow its decisions, they would lose their exemption under the Australian Privacy Act. The Australian Privacy Act only relates to data privacy. Um, but to lose that exemption would be very significant. Um, luckily, Parliament rejected the bill. Um, luck, well, not being political, but the government was defeated. Um, and I think the new government uh, won't be as interested in getting into those issues. Uh, the last thing Australia needs is government intervention in the media. Uh, then turning to the, uh, the privacy um, issue, um, the English, a couple of hundred years ago, sent us a um, lot of convicts uh, <laughs> that uh, we are very lucky that so far they haven't sent us their extraordinary extension of breaches of confidentiality. Uh, we don't have a statutory tort of privacy. Um, the High Court in Australia, our highest court, uh, decided in 2001 that in certain circumstances there could be a common law uh, tort of privacy in Australia. Um, and even though uh, two district courts, lower courts, have said that we do have a um, uh, common law tort of privacy, um, the reality is that we don't. Um, we do have significant protections of various areas of privacy. Uh, protecting children, um, uh, the divorce, family courts, uh, victims of sexual assault, listening devices, telecommunications interception, and the normal trespass, nuisance, and confidentiality. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have the uh, Privacy Act, which relates to data protection. And all of the media have adopted codes of conduct uh, in the privacy area. 
um, I might say I'm privacy, Lord um, Hunt is uh, privacy. Um, not a great difference, I don't think. Um, we have had a number of inquiries as to whether we should have a statutory tort of privacy. Uh, in 1979, the Australian Law Reform Commission uh, came out and was very concerned at the balance between privacy and freedom of speech and recommended a very limited tort. That wasn't adopted by the government of the time. In 1983, there was a further inquiry uh, which recommended that we do not have a statutory tort of privacy as um, it would be too vague and nebulous. And the reality is it would open the floodgates. In 2008, we had our third inquiry, uh, which did recommend a very wide-ranging statutory tort of privacy. Um, and in a um, surprising development, did not even uh, recommend a public interest uh, or fair comment defence. Uh, that wasn't accepted by the government, and now we have a further inquiry going on. Uh, that inquiry is likely to recommend a statutory tort. Uh, as I mentioned, the government has changed, and uh, we certainly will be lobbying uh, the government uh, not to adopt a, uh, a statutory tort. Um, the reason for that, I think, is that we have an Australian Press Council which covers the print media. Um, we have the Australian Communications and Media Authority, which covers um, online and uh, radio television. And when you look at the complaints to those bodies, you find that very, very few relate to privacy. Therefore, my view is that we do not need a statutory tort, because it basically would be cracking a nut with a sledgehammer. Um, I personally don't have any sympathy for someone like Princess Caroline, who uh, basically has a coffee in the Champs-Élysées and complains when a photograph is taken. Um, I don't have any sympathy for Prince Harry, who shows off the crown jewels in Las Vegas. <laughs> um, I do have sympathy uh, sometimes, and there's no doubt in Australia there have been a, a few bad uh, excesses um, and things that have been published. Uh, for example, we had a, uh, a minister of the state government in New South Wales, in Sydney, uh, who was photographed coming out of a gay sauna. Um, I, I really have great reservations that that sort of thing should be published. But um, I think that any statutory tort would go far too far um, and would open the floodgates. And mm. the media in Australia, as the media all around the world, is in a very tight situation financially. And the last thing they need is all of the plaintiffs, lawyers and barristers um, issuing lots of applications for breach of privacy. Thank you. Thank you. So perhaps we now uh, turn to closer to home, uh, <coughs> Professor Joseph Chan, Hong Kong. Uh, thank you, Cliff. Um, you know, I would like to thank uh, Lord Hunt, especially, you know, for bringing us update of the latest development of the uh, of self-regulation in United Kingdom. Um, in fact, the Hong Kong Press Council uh, was set up about 12 years ago, and it was inspired partially by the uh, UK Press Complaints Commission, and we try to learn, you know, from press councils around the, uh, the world. And we learned that you know, the UK um, press uh, complaints commissioner was you know, one of the best. And it was considered to be an exemplar. But now it is ev evaporating. So we do not know what is going to happen. You know. uh, so far, no one raised um, the option of setting up a statutory body in Hong Kong to police the press, at least. Up to now, not yet. Um, we still subscribed to the idea of self-regulation for the media. I think this is fundamental, you know, uh, for the autonomy of a profession or semi-profession. You know, we all argue that you know, probably journalism cannot be considered as a profession like law and medicine. Yeah, that, uh, there is, you know, great truth in that. You know, but. Uh, all through the ages, you know, 
journalists try to strive for autonomy. We believe in press freedom. Uh, we believe in the profession. By autonomy, that means you know, the ideal is to self-regulate rather than to be regulated by the state uh, or other means. So, you know, uh, the talk of self-regulation uh, always goes up and down uh, in tandem uh, with the criticism of the media. Uh, this happened to United Kingdom and also Hong Kong. Uh, we, the people find that you know, the media were very powerful, you know, and they find uh, media to be part of their life. But at the same time, you know, they find that the media um, suffer from a lot of problems, are plagued by a set of problems, including the uh, privacy intrusion, sensationalism, uh, the, the play up of sex and violence, uh, even uh, fabrication of news. So all these problems you know, overwhelm uh, our, uh, and our expectation of press freedom. And exactly in 1999, the Hong Kong Law Reform Committee find that <coughs> privacy intrusion was running rampant. As a result, it recommended that Hong Kong should set up a statutory body uh, to police the press in regard to privacy. And of course, you know, like the um, British counterparts, uh, the media uh, hurried to gather together and uh, unite and agree to set up the press council, saying that, you know, stay off from us. Let us discipline ourselves. So, you know, uh, the mass media in Hong Kong, you know, gather together and form uh, the Hong Kong Press Council in uh, 2000. This is a response to social criticism and also to the threat of being policed by the state. Uh, I think this is almost universally true uh, in other places as well. And as we set it up, you know, we want it to self-regulate. But at the same time, we don't want it to be all run by the media. Uh, we want it to be an NGO. As a result, we build in rules um, uh, setting uh, limits on the, the number of corporate members. By corporate members means members from the newspapers. And it is a rule that you know, the majority would be from ordinary citizens, and the minority would be corporate members. And the vice chairman and also the chairman would be citizens, uh, rather than uh, corporate uh, uh, members. And also, uh, for, uh, fin for financing, uh, we don't have the privilege of getting uh, membership fees from all the newspapers. Uh, they, put, they pay a token membership fee. Uh, we rely on donation. You know. uh, there are pros and cons. You know. So far, uh, we adopt the model of donation uh, primarily. And um, for the scope uh, of our work, uh, there are several purposes. One is to promote press freedom in Hong Kong. I think journalists and the citizens are worried that uh, press freedom in Hong Kong is going to be a breach, uh, especially after the handover. You know, so we are very concerned about that. And the second thing, and the most important thing is, uh, we want to promote the ethical standard of the Hong Kong newspapers. And in order to do that, we receive complaints from the citizens. Uh, and the ju our jurisdiction would rule over several areas. Initially, uh, privacy, uh, prurience, indecency, sensationalism. We le left out inaccuracy. So we, uh, we did not concern ourselves with inaccurate reporting at the beginning because we would find that you know, very complicated and you know, sometimes uh, it can be very controversial and we don't have the means uh, to verify anything. So we stay away from it until two years ago. 
and then we begin to pick up inaccuracy as part of our uh, jurisdiction. And uh, the way we run it is, you know, we did not proactively act on the media. Uh, we will act only when we receive complaints from the citizens. And for privacy issues, uh, the complaints would have to be filed uh, from the party affected. And um, so in the last uh, 12 years, you know, we have been doing this, and uh, uh, the, the, I don't have the time to talk about uh, you know, many cases, uh, maybe just a few cases to give you a taste of what we have been uh, working on. Uh, for instance, you know, in 2002, uh, quite a few newspapers displayed the dead bodies of three students who committed suicide in Changzhou. Uh, you know, you know uh, committing suicide is quite common in Hong Kong. I don't know how the suicide rates compare with other places. And this place is also known for uh, committing suicide by burning charcoal. Charcoal burning suicide, you know, is uh, quite fashionable at one time. Uh, I think it has something to do with the media's reports. In fact, you know, one study by uh, a colleague in a Hong Kong University, the Suicide Study Center, they find that uh, suicide can be contagious, uh, spreading from one place to another through media reporting. So charcoal burning has become fashionable uh, in other places like Korea and in Taiwan as well. So, um, we find that you know, indecency is a problem, and uh, we make a uh, reprimand uh, of it. And by the way, uh, the, the most severe penalty uh, filed by the press council is public reprimand, and that's it. Other, and we cannot find any uh, newspaper members or any other publication. So that is the most severe uh, penalty from us. And, and also in 2002, uh, a very famous actress in Hong Kong uh, was portrayed on the cover of a magazine called East Week. And uh, she was stripped. And uh, obviously, she was detained illegally you know, by some members of a secret society. And it uh, ended up in a, an uproar of the society. Uh, people protested, marched, uh, took to the streets. And uh, we also reprimanded uh, the magazines for doing this. And in connection to privacy issues, you know, we have two uh, more notable cases. One has to do with a student of Hong Kong U. Hong Kong U. Uh, she was an activist, um, and she was uh, covered by a magazine. Uh, uh, a journalist using telelens, uh, taking pictures of her inside her house, um, wearing just underwear, or walking from the kitchen to the bedroom, and so on and so forth. You know, and she was uh, put on the cover, and um, she complains to uh, the council, and we find that you know it is against, uh, it is an intrusion of privacy. The reason is because even though she is a public figure, but it has nothing to do with public interest. The other thing is she was walking in and out in her in her house, so it has she should have some reasonable expectation of privacy. So by these two principles, we rule that you know, it is an intrusion of privacy. A more recent example is in uh, 2010, and also you know, uh, a man, the, the husband of, a, of an actress, uh, he was suspected of sexually abusing a woman, and um, it becomes talk of the tongue at the time. And another magazine you know, took picture of the family behind curtains, just the shadow, and on, on the cover. And they make uh, up some 
conversations between the uh, family members. And uh, they filed a complaint to the council and ruled uh, that you know, the complaint was established for exactly the same reason. Even though they are public figures, but at the same time, you know, they have reasonable expectations. They are behind the curtains, inside the house. And also the conversation was just fabricated. So the, you know, we dealt with all these cases. The question is, yes, the press council effective. If self-regulation effective, you know, does it matter to have a press council? You know, that is the critical question, right? And to answer this question, you know, I'm not in a good position to do it. You know, as a chairman, you know, of course, I think you know, it must be very effective. Uh, in fact, this is a difficult question you know, for press councils around the world. You know. What kind of indicators do you have? Now, what I can say is this. You know, uh, in terms of statistics, uh, for the number of complaints we have, you know, uh, 457 up to now in 12 years' time. Number of complainants, 2,500. You know, not bad in terms of numbers, complainants, okay? And then the, uh, how many complaints got established? 71, uh, not too many. Uh, how many public reprimands uh, did we issue? About 20, you know, uh, not too many. So it is difficult to get, not so easy to get complaints established, you know, in the case of uh, the council. And also we conducted uh, surveys of the Hong Kong population from time to time. Uh, the latest one is done in 2010. Uh, by recognition, you know, do people recognize the Hong Kong Press Council? You know, about 52% of the people say, admit they, had, they heard of the uh, council. And then ask them, do you, know, do you think the council is effective? You know, perceive the effectiveness, okay? Uh, we did it, we did once in 2002, uh, about 38% say that you know, the council was generally effective. And then by 2010, uh, that's about eight years later, uh, the per that percentage has increased to 63%. You know. All right, not bad you know, in terms of numbers, okay? Mm -hmm. But they are just saying that generally effective. And then we, at the same time, we asked them, do you think that uh, the press council is ineffective? Ineffective, you know? Uh, for that part, you know, about 30% of the people still think that you know, the council is still uh, is ineffective. Uh, the other thing is, you know, with this uh, widening social recognition, uh, we can see that more and more people uh, uh, opt for making a complaint to the council. Uh, this includes politicians and also uh, actors and actresses. Now, I can only conclude that, you know, uh, the press council in Hong Kong is a toothless tiger because we don't have the right to penalize anyone, you know, in a substantive way. But so far, it remains, it is a, an ethical force in Hong Kong. And the, the reason is no media including the more delinquent media, would like to have their name you know, uh, downgraded. They do, no one would like to suffer in reputation because they want to have high credibilities. So uh, you know, we are almost cel celebrating the 13 years an anniversary. Uh, we still subscribe to the self-regulation principle. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, from uh, Hong Kong to New Zealand, uh, <coughs> Professor Ursula Chia. Thank you.
Thank you, Cliff. And um, it's a real pleasure to be here today and for the conference. It's been wonderful to meet you all um, and see such a variety of different forms of regulation of media in different countries in the world and really compare them to what we have in New Zealand. So I've been asked today to talk to you about uh, New Zealand's recent look at how our media should be regulated. And um, i start first really by just pointing out that New Zealand is a very small country in the South Pacific. It's a long way away from anywhere. Um, after our uh, indigenous peoples, the Maori, we were colonised, uh, not by convicts, Peter, but <laughs> by idealists and people looking for an ideal society of some kind. And I think, in a way, our drives for law reform have possibly continued in that vein. We like to look at things comprehensively, tidy everything up, and have it running smoothly. Uh, but that's not been the case with this recent review. Uh, and the thing about being a small country a long way away from everywhere is that um, we've only got a small population, although our geographical size is the same as England and Wales, we have four million people. And that means very small media audiences, very small markets. There's not a lot of money to be made out of media in New Zealand. However, in the last, um, uh, the latest Press Freedom Index, we were ranked eighth and uh, we've always ranked quite well in terms of press freedom. Um, I think that's higher, in fact, than any country that's here at the conference. I might be wrong about that. Um, we've got rid of criminal libel. We've got rid of sedition. We've hung on to blasphemy, strangely enough. Our Court of Appeal insists that we need that in order to meet our international obligations as regards religious freedom. Ain't human rights complex. Um, but in terms of media ownership, that means that we've only got four major commercial players in the market in New Zealand. APN and Fairfax are the market leaders, leaders in our print media. MediaWorks and APN dominate our radio networks. MediaWorks and Sky TV are the major players in our television markets, and Sky TV, in fact, has a near monopoly in our pay TV sector. Um, our public broadcasters exist, of course, although they're all now on commercial models, TV1, TV2, and various other um, uh, uh, television stations and Radio New Zealand, often referred to as the jewel in the crown, probably the only um, uh, public broadcaster we now have operating on truly um, public interest uh, uh, lines. So what we have is a small and comparatively well-behaved media, in fact. Even our Court of Appeal has said so, although that was some time ago. And so given that we're also a very stable society with very few um, civil liberties issues, uh, the risk for us is that we become complacent about um, freedoms, including, of course, freedom of expression and how the media behaves and how it should be regulated. In terms of being well-behaved media, we have had very few suggestions of anything um, endemic or illegal in the way that the media behaves. Although in 2012, our Prime Minister did refer a matter of possible illegal interception of private communications to the police. Now this was in uh, just before the run-up to our election last year, and our uh, Prime Minister, John Key, um, is there having a meeting uh, a cup of tea, in fact, with a political ally of his, Mr John Banks. This was, of course, a publicity stunt, but the idea was that they were going to meet in a cafe and have a cup of tea and just chat about um, strategy and that sort of thing. The media, of course, were there, and they were all squeezed into this cafe in a very busy, um, awkward afternoon. There were other people uh, in the room, lots of other people having or trying to have a cup of tea as well. But at a certain point, Mr Banks and Mr Key decided they wanted to be alone, and they sent the media outside. There they are, pressed up against the window. But of course, this picture ignores the fact that there were still people in the cafe, the people serving, and other people genuinely having a cup of tea. When the discussion had finished, it was discovered that lying on the table, there was a small electronic recording device. <laughs> This, it transpired, belonged to, um, let me just fix this up, sorry. 
belonged to a television cameraman, an independent cameraman who was there. It was a recording device that was connected to his camera, which he now had outside with him, outside the window, and it was turned on, apparently accidentally, according to Mr. Bradley Ambrose, the camera <laughs> operator. <laughs> Uh, when this was discovered, the security people for Mr Key insisted that this device be handed over. Mr Ambrose, in the meantime, actually had his own recording, which he then handed on to the New Zealand Herald newspaper. Uh, there was then a long and protracted um, conflict about whether this information would actually be published or not. And as I say, in the meantime, it was referred to the police under our Crimes Act, which contains uh, sections around illegal interception of private communications. The police began their investigations and obtained a warrant. And under that warrant, they uplifted Mr. Ambrose's um, emails and records of his phone calls. The uh, investigation took some time. In the meantime, Mr Ambrose said, I have been defamed, and he went to the High Court seeking a declaration saying just this. The judge in the High Court said, I cannot do anything in the meantime while the police investigation is going on, and uh, the matter was left there. The police finally completed their investigation um, after the election, it has to be said, and decided that uh, no charges would be laid, but they warned Mr Ambrose, who had also apologised, and they said he actually had behaved illegally, but they just weren't going to do anything about it at this point. Most commentators pointed out that um, probably it seemed unlikely that this was a private communication, or indeed that the cameraman had the state of mind that was required. You had to intentionally um, seek to record the conversation. So the matter was did never actually went to law, although, as I say, there was great doubt about whether that actual criminal offence would have applied in the circumstances. Recently, another member of the media applied for the... Um, uh, record of the telephone calls that have been obtained under the warrant, and they obtained these under the Official Information Act. And these records appear to show that indeed the cameraman was telling the truth. This was an accidental recording, and he had no actual intention. So you might say a storm in a teacup. Um, what does seem clear is that perhaps our Prime Minister referred the matter rather quickly and that the police did appear to be very keen to cooperate and um, press matters quite closely. But look, if this is the only thing we're worried about um, in terms of media behaviour in New Zealand, we're doing extremely well. <laughs> So what have we got regulating media at the moment? We've got a Broadcasting Standards Authority, which is a form of co-regulation, um, set up under statute, uh, complaints based after the event, significant powers to order compensation, some costs. They can actually order broadcasters off the air for up to 24 hours, although they've only done that twice in their history. They tend to uphold 25% of uh, complaints, but um, in the last year, this number was reduced to 10%, which was very interesting. The BSA has changed its membership recently, and I think membership can make a great deal of difference to how these bodies behave. Um, the BSA currently at the moment also tends not to impose any orders. They just tend to um, make a decision uh, finding that uh, a complaint's been upheld. The print media has the press council, again, very similar to the UK model, a form of self-regulation. Membership is voluntary. It has power only to order publication of its decisions. Now, though, it is trying to revamp itself. It has been quite strongly criticised in the past. Media have referred it to me as, um, like, if you get uh, an upheld complaint from the press council, it's like being slapped on the wrist with a wet bus ticket. Um, so in terms of trying to improve themselves, they have reviewed themselves recently, and now they're working on mediation. And their uphold rates in the past have tended to be 10% of complaints. But um, last year, they <coughs> excuse me, uh, upheld 29% of complaints. So I think, in fact, they're swapping places with the BSA at the moment. We've also now got this very new body, the Online Media Standards Authority, otherwise known as OMSA. Now, this has just uh, begun operating this year. It, uh, again, is a voluntary body, um, a form of self-regulation. It's based on a model like our Advertising Standards Authority. It has two um, bo bodies, a complaints body and then an appeals body. It also has a filtering process with a chair who filters out um, complaints that shouldn't go the distance. 
um, and it can order publication of decisions on websites. Um, it will also consider other uh, remedies like corrections, rights of reply and apology, but no um, fines. But um, with that system of regulation and with our rather well-behaved media, we've never had anything like this, nor indeed anything like this. Now those, of course, led to this, and we have had our own equivalent, which has run around the same time as all the other um, regulatory reviews that have been discussed today. So our Law Commission has investigated regulation of news media in New Zealand, um, and they have put out a report, certainly not as big as the Leveson report, not even as big as one of the volumes of the Leveson report, but very thorough nonetheless. Um, our Law Commission talked to regulators, media, um, the public, and it ran online forums, and it received in the end 72 formal submissions. Again, that must sound laughable compared to what happened with the Leveson inquiry. Um, nonetheless, our inquiry, um, which has spread over three years and finally reported uh, in March this year, um, was, as I said, extremely thorough. And um, the purpose and the reason for our inquiry, of course, was different from the other regulations because uh, the other reviews, because um, it was not seen in New Zealand that we had market failure. Our aim was to look for some sort of regulatory review to fill the gaps in the system because of the rise of um, new technologies and new forms of media. So a completely different reason for our review. And what did the Law Commission recommend? Well, first of all, they suggested that we have um, a one uh, comprehensive definition of media that would be used in all um, statutes that are relevant to the media and indeed within the regulatory system itself. So there's the definition. Um, um, news media would be uh, a body that has a significant proportion of publishing activities involving generating or indeed aggregation of news information and opinion. Um, they would disseminate this to a public audience Publication is regular and not occasional, and this publisher is accountable to a code of ethics and a complaints process. So in theory, then, that definition could apply to bloggers, um, although, of course, not very many bloggers will be seeking to have a code of ethics and a complaints process. Then the commission um, uh, uh, suggested a new grand regulatory body called the News Media Standards Authority, otherwise known as NIMSA, this would be a voluntary body. So the basic model is self-regulation, um, but it, it media, mainstream media would be incentivized to join this body by having access to privileges that they have in the law at the moment. For example, presumptive access to courts, exemptions from regulatory statutes like the Privacy and the Fair Trading Act, access to the defenses, special defenses and defamation and that sort of thing. Importantly, membership would be independent of both media and government, and there would be an independent panel set up to appoint the members. Um, I had some concerns about that. New Zealand is an extremely small country, and I um, uh, think it would be quite difficult to even find a panel that would be able to be completely independent. Um, but nonetheless, you can see how our recommendations from the Law Commission very much are a mixture of what was going on in Leveson and in the Australian reviews as well, with an eye to how Leveson was being received in the UK. So very much uh, uh, trying to find that middle path through all of the um, uh, potholes that have plagued the other inquiries. Members would fund the body, but government would provide some funding for research. Um, there would be a mediation service and also appeal to an independent body. In terms of remedies, power to make takedown orders, correction orders, apologies, rights of reply and censure, no fines, nothing of that kind. How would the rulings be binding? Members would agree to be bound by signing a contract. Again, I have difficulties with this in terms of accessibility. Um, I'm not quite sure how signing a contract, although I'm sure there are ways and the, um, this would have been worked out, um, to ensure that a member of the public complaining uh, is not delayed by the fact that they've got a member of the regulatory body who decides they're not going to comply with their contract. How do you enforce that contract? Those were the concerns I had in relation to accessibility in terms of complainants. 
What about the media who wouldn't join? Well, the Commission pointed out they would still be covered by the other laws, for example, our defamation and privacy laws, aspects of the Privacy Act. Also, as part of this review, the Law Commission had recommended new laws to deal specifically with cyberbullying and the harms caused by speech online. Now, our government lifted out this part of the review during the process and asked for a special briefing paper on it. And you could see right away that they were keen to implement this and not so keen on the rest of it. So lifting it out in 2012, um, these recommendations about cyberbullying recommended a specific criminal offence that would um, be based on serious harm um, and also a new com com communications tribunal to be set up dealing with speech that also causes serious harm. So this was a form of um, low-level um, informal dispute resolution, in a way, carried out through a tribunal. The government has picked up on both of those recommendations and says they'll put the criminal offence um, into the law. And instead of there being a tribunal set up, um, they're going to give those powers to our district court judges. Um, our district court judges are quite busy. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's a very good idea. So those are the basic recommendations. Um, what was the government response to that? Here it is, we got it uh, on the 12th of September, not very long ago at all, not to give effect at this time to the Law Commission's proposals, but to observe the further impact of technolog technological convergence on the news media and the news media's response to it. Now, part of the way um, the news media dealt with this was by setting up OMSA halfway through the process. So by the broadcasters getting together and setting up an online media standards authority, their own self-regulation, they have in part plugged a gap in the law. And I'm sure, I'm convinced, that has helped convince the government um, that uh, in the meantime they don't need to do anything. Also, the press um, council and the BSA have both said they're reviewing how they operate and attempting um, to uh, bring in uh, new ways of dealing with complaints that make uh, the way they do their work better. Um, they, the government also said the Law Commission's proposal will be kept in mind, pop it on the back um, burner in the meantime, um, to deal any, with any difficulties presented by media convergence in the future. Um, so that's where it stands. Cyberbullying is going ahead because that's quite nice and sexy and everyone was quite keen on that for a while. Um, there's not very much money around at the moment and also I think the appearance of OMSA um, helped um, put off any actual major change in terms of regulation in New Zealand at the moment. Um, so, of course, we don't have a comprehensive system at the moment. The Law Commission tried to design something that was uh, comprehensive, um, tidy, uh, clear, a one-stop shop for everyone to go to. We've now got three bodies for complaints and gaps where, of course, you have um, people who are not covered by one of these regulators. An example has happened since I've come over to the conference. In fact, a story was broken um, about a man who's just been elected mayor of Auckland in New Zealand, and a story was broken by a right-wing blogger who sometimes breaks news stories um, that this mayor has had an adulterous affair for the last two years. Um, and the coverage, I must say, has looked a lot like news of the world coverage um, uh, of this uh, particular. We're, we're very tight on time now. Yeah, Thank I'm you. just about finished. I've got two, two slides to go. So um, uh, what I ask about that is what would happen to that blogger? He has doesn't belong to any regulatory system. He doesn't have a code of ethics. And he has stated openly that his breaking of the story was politically motivated. He was supporting um, the opposite candidate in that election. So in the meantime, we have two privacy torts. A tort of invasion of privacy by publication of personal information. That's very similar to the UK tort, although we've got a slightly extra step there. Um, and now we've got a very new tort of intrusion into seclusion that doesn't have a public interest defence, although the first tort does. Um, I think the second tort, which appeared so very recently, will in the future possibly apply to media methods in that a, um, a public interest defence will have to be developed to cover this within terms of media. But the final point I make is that if we have regulators who don't 
um, uh, regulate in a balanced way, um, obviously allowing for freedom of expression and the interests of people who are making complaints and have been harmed by speech, then I think you get more and more robust torts of this kind developing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I must remember the uh, accidental recording defence. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> Uh, and now uh, we have uh, Chelsea from Indonesia. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, high appreciation from the Chairman of Press Council of Indonesia to the organizers. Thank you for having us uh, able to present about ourselves here. Uh, first of all, I understand time is very limited now. Um, like Lord Han mentioned before, once the model set up by a law pub, uh, pa passed by the parliament, it will be difficult for the media society to change it. It's happened in Indonesia because the press law number 14, 1999, was established by the parliament session. And up to now, we try our best not being changed. Because why? Once, it's, uh, once the discussion start to change the law, we will open the so-called uh, Pandora box. Then they will try uh, their best to put everything, like b try to ban the paper again, and everything like the previous time what we have during the Suharto era. So what happened now is the press law number 14, 1999 is the only one among about 5,000 laws passed in this country, in our country, that do not have so-called government regulation or minister decree or so other call. Uh, what we have right now is the council itself called by the media society to establish self-regulation. From 2000 until 2012, we have about 10 only, not so many. But we proudly say that it's, it's, it's developed by the media society itself, by the practitioner, by the academician, and it's accepted by the media. And it's followed by the media, by the practitioners. So when we when we receive a submission or a complaint from the public about one or two uh, uh, newspaper or articles uh, uh, on certain names, and they would like to submit as a uh, defame uh, cases, uh, uh, the, the, the police right now, currently, uh, because of the memorandum of understanding between the council and the national police, uh, happily offer to the council to be settled by the council. So no longer, I must admit, maybe still, uh, 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 because it's just one, one year, the, the memorandum of understanding, but uh, when the chief of national police agreed to sign the MOU between, with the press council of Indonesia, all level of the police in the country start to offer all complaint related to defamation made or, or, or suspected uh, defamation case related to media offered to the council to be settled uh, in, in a way of news adjudication or mediation. So we are happy that uh, right now less and less cases go to the police or less and less cases go to the court for this uh, matter. And, uh, uh, I must say also in, in front of you that we proudly have a unique council model. We do not, we do not follow the Council of uh, Hong Kong, which is established by the industry, uh, and, and uh, we do not have the Press Complaint Commission model in UK, but we do have our own model where the council itself uh, provide nine members, and among the members, uh, three coming from the high-profile uh, society. And right now, we, the chairman of the Press Council of Indonesia uh, is uh, chaired by the retired uh, judge of Supreme Court, uh, Professor Bagimanan. 
and the other three members of the council coming from the journalist associations and also the other three uh, members coming from the uh, media ownership. But when we settle a case, one complaint, when, when the complaint come and it's involved one of the media company where the members sit, uh, we have this uh, uh, internal statutory that this member cannot join the, 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 uh, the case. Then the decision will be, m will be made independently out of the member uh, and, uh, few. So that's, that's the situation where we have. And another very good development, I don't know whether this can be a very good model for, for the others, is just one more thing. Uh, beside the memorandum of understanding with the national police, we have success uh, promoting press freedom to the, to the court, basically. In 2008, the chair, the president, or the chair of the Supreme Court finally agreed to uh, sign and disseminate a circular letter, a circular letter to uh, the court across the country, and that require uh, admitting and inviting press counsel to be uh, an expert witness in front of the court when the court facing the news cases. So I think this is one a good development in our history in Indonesia, considering uh, past situation. I think that's all I want to share with you, and I hope it's useful. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much to uh, all of our uh, panelists. Um, we've had uh, some very interesting, very different uh, perspectives from different parts of the, uh, the world. Um, it would be uh, <coughs> very good, I think, to, to see um, <coughs> if we can learn, from, learn uh, some lessons from, uh, from this experience. Um, perhaps in the uh, little time we have left, I, I could ask uh, Lord Hunt. Um <coughs> <laughs> Surely you hadn't fallen asleep. Uh <laughs> Um, everybody is watching events uh, in the UK. Um, you, you told me earlier that as a lawyer you like to, to sort out a mess. Um, <coughs> seems that's, uh, that's what you're facing at the, at the moment. Uh, how, how do you see this playing out? How is this going to be resolved? Um, are we going to see media organisations signing up for IPSO and then finding that they face uh, exemplary damages? Um, there, there has to be some solution. How do you see that playing out? I think that's a very good question to Jill Phillips in the next session. <laughs> <laughs> because I do rather rely on Jill and her colleagues because I'm not involved in the drafting of these contracts, but Jill may be able to throw some light. But certainly I gave those basic details of the new organization to you earlier, and of course there's much more detail. In the meantime, by the way, the Press Complaints Commission is continuing to function. And we've dealt with just under 5,000 complaints so far this year, including complaints against TV and adverts, which we couldn't deal with. We've made 1,513 rulings this year. And of those who have dealt with the PCC, 73% of all those complainants did actually think that the service they'd received was satisfactory. So don't let's um, downplay, particularly so far as the local and regional press is concerned, the importance of the existing structure, which will move into the new structure. How do I see it playing out? First of all, I think the charter will become a true cul-de-sac. I don't think it'll get any further. I think it's wrong. Uh, Lord Justice Leveson never put forward that idea. I think it's a backward step, and I wouldn't want to see this new body have to conform to a charter laid down by Parliament. As to the new body, I think it'll get up and running reasonably soon, provided the contracts are all agreed. I believe every major publisher will sign up to it. At least they've told me they will and I have every confidence that they will. And then, of course, what Nicholas Phillips, our immediate past president of the Supreme Court, told me, 
he said, whatever we do, that's me and my position as a, uh, as a sort of backroom solicitor, as all solicitors are, and he as a frontline senior judge, uh, we both agreed that the first test of the new body and its independence will come within the first six months. That is when it will have to prove that this is a step in the right direction, and I believe it will. Thank you. Lord Lester's jumping at the bit. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted, you see, the thing is, David Hunt is a much more diplomatic and charming person than I could ever be. And therefore, he <laughs> slightly underplayed the outrageous situation in our country. So on the principle you should never attack your own country when abroad, I just have to say one or two additional <laughs> things. First, first of all, uh, one of the things that Lord Justice Leveson recommended was narrowing the defences for journalism under the data protection legislation. Uh, and that is now, I'm afraid, pending. The government are looking at ways of narrowing the protection that journalists have. I believe that's completely uncalled for. Secondly, our journalists are now being prosecuted on a scale never seen before because we have so many excellent criminal laws which they have broken or because civil claims for damages are being pursued for breach of confidence or privacy. So we don't actually need any new legislation, thank you very much, but I, there are many journalists now quite rightly being prosecuted with massive sanctions. The third thing is that when Oliver Letwin, uh, another gentleman, sat down with the leaders of my party and of the Labour Party in private, they did something extraordinarily stupid, which was they allowed hacked off at two in the morning into the negotiations in order to settle what would be the political carve up of the three parties. They didn't allow the, the, the journalists in, but they allowed hacked off in. And what we now have is two acts of parliament disfigured. One by making the charter essentially statutory, which David has talked about, and the other providing for exemplary damages before you even get any further from where we now are. So all of this, I'm afraid, I regard as completely deplorable. But what is very depressing is that there are very few politicians who agree with me. And I wish I were in, Aust in New Zealand, my favorite country. <laughs> <laughs> Cliff, could I just make a response to Lord Please Hunt? Do. Um, I, I, I'm heartened to hear your proposal about the new body and to hear the detail of that, but I would say that not only is it the first six months in which that body has to prove its mettle, I think it's 10 years down the track as well because the English media has been reviewed every 10 years and the standards must stay the same. They mustn't slip would be my point. Yeah, I agree. I agree uh, completely. I'm always slightly worried when a woman, woman looks me straight in the eye and says, you need a new body. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I promise you, I promise you we will have a, a, a new body, but you're quite right. It'll be uh, judged over time. Um, and I think, in many ways, that's why I'm optimistic. I suppose... I, I once asked, what's the definition of an optimism? I was told a pessimist is somebody who sees a calamity in every opportunity, whereas an optimist is someone who sees an opportunity in every calamity. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any more time? Yeah, are there any questions? Ah, Mark Stevens. Yes, Thank you. I, I just wondered, uh, slightly provocatively, whether we shouldn't uh, take a lesson out of the Australian book, uh, have uh, an inquisition into the media, and then ignore it. <laughs> we have a tremendous uh, history of having so many government inquiries, and they're all gathering dust. Yes, we have something similar in Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> um. Any more questions? 
please do. <laughs> the, the, the Hong Kong um, uh, Council uh, doesn't apparently deal with standards at all. You said that it deals with individual complaints, and that was true of the PCC as well. But it seems to me that a regulatory body needs also to look at overall standards of the press in order to make sure that the press, as far as possible, acts professionally. So for example, uh, if newspapers were accused of being racist, systemically racist, uh, in ways that really violated any basic democratic principle at all, it seems to me that the regulatory body ought to look into the responsibility of newspapers for handling uh, sensitive issues of race relations uh, and not simply wait for an individual black person to come and say, I have been attacked viciously because of my skin color. Is, is it true that in Hong Kong, as in the UK out of the old system, there's no capacity for looking at standards in that general way? Yeah, for the standards, you know, in Hong Kong, we go by the standards uh, generally are set, adopted, you know, by the four uh, journalist organizations in Hong Kong, including the Hong Kong Journalist Association, the Federation of Zong, and so on and so forth. That means, you know, all, they, we have four organizations in Hong Kong, they adopt a common uh, core practice, and we go by that standard, you know, as far as the principles are concerned. But the, 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 what you're essentially saying is, is that should we go proactively, you know, jump on media if, if they are not behaving well, you know? Um, that will raise a lot of questions on our part. That, you know, we don't have the manpower to monitor, you know, every single uh, piece of news in, in that regard. So, you know, we have, it is better, you know, for us to wait for them to uh, make the complaints. But, uh, you know, in some ways, you know, we do, act out uh, proactively. Uh, one is, has to do with suicide reporting. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, suicide rates has been going up and down in Hong Kong. You know, recently it has been going down, you know, or remain stable, you know. But at one time, you know, the, the, you know um, there was a surge of uh, suicides. And then we are concerned about, you know, how suicide reporting um, spread uh, around. Uh, and we find that it is, better, you know, for Hong Kong media to go by certain standards on suicide reporting, such as not revealing the details on the methods of committing suicide and so on. So in that regard, you know, we uh, uh, make the announcement that, you know, we will adopt this set of standards and then we let the media know. So in a way, we are trying to set a new standard for them. You know. But we have to work on this rather carefully. It takes us you know, one year of consultation before we do it. Um, Joseph, thank you so much for that response. And I think one thing um, they also face, the Hong Kong Press Council, is defamation law. Um, as we've heard earlier, um, the Hong Kong media have no problem uh, with bringing suits against other media and other actors as well. And so at one point, the Hong Kong Press Council was asking for a statutory exemption to the defamation law, like the um, omnibus law and so forth, uh, and they do not have that at this stage. So they have to tread a bit carefully sometimes when they want to make public statements against a certain uh, media actors. Um, one other point I wanted to point out about uh, Chelsea and what she had raised is a frequent problem in uh, Southeast Asia uh, where press law and press councils can actually be not a buffer against bad behavior by the media, but maybe bad behavior by other actors, including government, um, where they are uh, an alternative for harsher laws. So it was a big victory uh, in Indonesia where um, they said, let's use the press laws instead of criminal defamation laws. Uh, so that actually was seen as a way of helping uh, facilitate uh, press freedom in Indonesia. <laughs> Thank you, Doreen. Lord Hunt, would you like to make a point? Just to say, I think all of us are on this panel are, are talking about um, standards and ethics and responsible journalism. That's what it's all about. That's what we're promoting. And certainly on suicides in the UK, we've had some very good periods of consultation, particularly with the Samaritans, and I've met most of the organizations. Uh, who have to deal with the consequences of bereavement 
and in particular any form of death. And I must say I've been very impressed by the way in which the press has responded very positively. And also, can I just mention, I, I should have said that uh, I have the ability to issue desist notices. In fact, I did one from Hong Kong about 12 hours ago <laughs> where you have to just say to the press, just hold back, please, because this family needs to be left alone or this individual does not want intrusion. And I have to tell you, every time we ever issue one of those notices, there's an immediate positive response. And finally, the code of practice, which um, got a, a very uh, warm uh, degree of applause from Lord Justice Leveson, which is the editor's code of practice under this new body, as indeed in most uh, publications now, it is a term of your contract of employment with the uh, newspaper or magazine that this code will be observed by you at all times. And I think, I think that the reason I'm so against state interference is that it should be completely unnecessary in any good free society. Thank you very much. <coughs> if I could just add that uh, in Australia we don't have a desist uh, coming from our press council, but um, every editor, um, it's, it's extraordinary the number of times that uh, I have discussions with editors on uh, ethical issues as opposed to legal issues. Um, and so you don't find uh, in Australia the things published that might be, for example, have appeared in the London Sun over time. Um, also, we do have in our ethical rules um, uh, systems relating to suicide and what can be published and what shouldn't be published. Uh, and that all works very well, but it's all voluntary. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank again uh, all of our panellists. Uh, very interesting discussion. Thank you.